Australia is a continent, or at least that's what I was taught in school. It was one of the seven continents, along with Asia, Africa, Europe, North and South America, oh yeah, and Antarctica, though depending on where you live, you might have been taught something else. I asked my followers on Twitter what they were taught, and it would appear that if you're from Mexico or the rest of Latin America, most parts of Europe, or honestly anywhere that speaks a language other than English, chances are you think of this whole region as Oceania, with Australia serving simply as the biggest island within a collection of islands that also includes Sulawesi, New Guinea, New Caledonia, New Zealand, and so on. This difference in thought has in turn generated a lot of confusion regarding the land's proper status, with people still asking me to this day, is Australia an island or a continent? Hang on, wait just a second. I've talked enough about continents on this channel to know there is no satisfying answer to this question because the term continent is entirely arbitrary. I mean, what exactly is a continent anyways? Aren't all continents just big islands? It's just nonsense someone made up thousands of years ago that we've been rolling with ever since. That's why lately I've abandoned the concept of continents altogether in favor of what are called biogeographic realms. If you're new here, well, <laughs> you've got some catching up to do, but long story short, biogeography is a field of study that uses the distribution of plants and animals rather than people or cultures to arrange the world into distinct units, each with their own unique assemblages of life. By sheer coincidence, there are also seven of these so-called realms, and at first glance they appear pretty similar to our seven continents. A closer look, however, will reveal some notable differences, like how the Neotropics push the Nearctic all the way back to Mexico, or how Northern Africa is included in the Palearctic with the rest of Europe and Asia, rather than the Afrotropic, or even how India and the rest of Southeast Asia have graduated from subcontinent to the realm of Indo-Malaya. But checking out the land down under will actually find a familiar layout, where Australia serves as the largest part of an even larger Austral-Asian realm, along with the rest of its surrounding islands, almost perfectly corresponding to the definition of Oceania. What this tells us is that Australia definitely is not a realm, but we already knew that. After all, none of the other traditional continents are exactly their own realms either. But then this leaves the question, if not a realm, then what is Australia in a biogeographic sense? Well, so far in our exploration of this field, we've only ever classified land masses as one of two things, either a mainland or an island. And this way of thinking about things makes a lot more sense to me, as you get a better idea of the natural relationship the lands share with one another. So that's what I want to explore today, using biogeography to hopefully answer this question of Australia being an island once and for all. Now, if I had to guess, I'd say 99% of all the confusion surrounding Australia comes down to its size. If you consider it an island, it's by far the biggest island on Earth, and nearly four times the area of the next biggest, Greenland. If you consider it a continent, it's by far the smallest one, nearly half the size of the next smallest, Antarctica. It would seem, no matter how or where you draw the line, so long as the only two options are between being a continent or an island, Australia is an outlier. I guess this is why some people opt out of this discussion entirely by simply choosing to call it an island continent, but this sort of feels like a cheap way out, so we're not taking that route. Instead, when it comes to biogeography, the size of an area matters far less than its biological composition, making terms like mainland and island relative to their situation. So sure, a continent will always be mainland to large islands in their proximity, but then that very same island may serve as the mainland to the rest of the smaller islands in the region each of which in turn could very well act as their own mainlands for any smaller isles off their coasts. Though if you follow the mainlands back up to the biggest scale possible, each realm should only have one mainland. 
This makes sense, right? If a realm had two distinct mainlands, each with their own unique flora and fauna, then that would just be two different realms. So by definition, biogeographic realms should only consist of a single mainland. Knowing this, we're left asking, does Australia serve as the mainland for Austral Asia? Or I guess an even more basic way of putting this would be, what is the mainland of the Austral Asian realm? Again, at first glance, the answer appears obvious. Being by far the biggest landmass here, how could Australia not be the mainland in this situation? Well, you see, there's an inherent problem with this question in that there are three ways of answering it. In a broader, more historical sense, the only landmass all of these places can truly trace 100% of their lineages to doesn't exist anymore, but rather existed some 150 million years ago, just as a rift was starting to tear Pangaea into Laurasia and Gondwana during a time period known as the Early Cretaceous, or in layman's terms, the Golden Age of the Dinosaurs. It was the utter dominance of these creatures that drove others like synapsids into exploring new evolutionary strategies like birthing live young, maintaining warm blood, growing fur, and producing milk in specialized organs called mammaries. Once they started doing this, they were no longer synapsids, but rather mammals. The oldest definitive fossils of our most primitive ancestors comes from around 160 million year old rocks found in what's now modern day China, but at the time was just a part of greater Eurasia. Over the next 50 million years, the first waves of mammals spread westward, reaching both Africa and North America by around 110 million years ago. Naturally, the further these little creatures expanded, the more divergent their gene pools became, and it wasn't long before here in North America, evolution produced the first step in what would become a new family of mammals, ones that started birthing their young before they were fully developed, and let them finish growing to maturity within their mother's newly developed organ, called a marsupium, or as most would call it, their pouch. While they were still technically mammals, this distinguished them as a particular kind of mammal, a marsupial. Now, while this adaptation certainly came with some advantages, like an easier birthing process, in other ways it made life more difficult, like then needing to carry around your offspring in a bag made of your own flesh. And so ultimately, this evolutionary pathway didn't really give marsupials much of a competitive advantage over the other regular or placental mammals, explaining why the first marsupials quickly went extinct in their native arena. Miraculously, however, before they did, North and South America were still close enough that a few marsupials managed to cross the narrow sea and establish a new population. Here, the marsupials actually seemed to thrive, at least over any placental mammals, allowing them to continue spreading slowly but surely across the lands of Gondwana. This inward push was interrupted, however, when a new rift started to form between India and Africa, effectively cutting Australia and Antarctica off from the rest of the world, with the exception of the southernmost tip of South America. It was by crossing this narrow channel that these tiny creatures once again beat the odds and successfully colonized another continent. But okay, here is where the fossil record runs a little thin, as we don't have nearly as many findings from Antarctica as we do from the rest of the world, surely the result of its entire surface being locked away under several miles of ice. So we don't really know what marsupials were up to while they were here. I mean, we can assume they continued to proliferate throughout Antarctica, filling small herbivorous niches, but by 50 million years ago, marsupials still hadn't reached the lands of Australia, which was a problem because for a third time now, another new ocean rift had already started to form and drive the two land masses apart. Briefly, this new divide left Australia as the only major landmass on Earth without any kind of mammals. But as we've already seen twice today, marsupials were, for whatever reason, experts at traversing narrow seaways, where all other mammals failed to. 
This knack for rafting between continents is what landed a small population, likely just a single species of marsupial on the shores of Australia after it had already broken away. Why this all matters is because this made Australia and the islands associated with it the only region on earth where all other placental mammals failed to reach, and without such tough competition, this opened the door for marsupials to eventually dominate the realm's animal community. Coincidentally, around the same time as all this, marsupials' journey was paralleled by that of another organism, eucalyptus trees. Having most likely originated somewhere in South America, they followed a similar route through Antarctica to eventually end up in Australia. While it's debated exactly how fast eucalyptus trees rose to prominence within Australia's forests, its particular resistance to fire certainly gave it an advantage over the rest of the trees here, especially as Australia became drier and drier, and forest fires became more and more regular, paving the way for eucalyptus trees to take over. In fact, they found enough success here to support growing into the second tallest trees on Earth, only standing shorter than the mighty sequoias of California. Like this, we can see that both Australasia's predominant plants and animals had their origins on the supercontinent Gondwana, and only later colonized Australia. Or, in other words, Gondwana clearly acted as the mainland by supplying Australia with all its species, just as if it were an island. However, from 50 million years onwards, the story changes entirely, as Australia's isolation from all other lands started to breed new marsupials and new kinds of eucalyptus trees entirely unique to this landmass. This is when you could say Australasia as a realm really differentiated itself from its broader Gondwanan origins. Over the next 50 million years, this landmass would change constantly, with parts of its northern shelf, what's now New Guinea, regularly falling beneath the ocean, leaving only the Australian end of the landmass dry. What this means is that it was here on Australia proper where the bulk of Australasia's distinguishing evolution took place, filling the land with hundreds of eucalyptus species, producing the realm's dominant herbivores like kangaroos and wallabies, alongside thylacines, the land's largest carnivores, to hunt them. Heck, some marsupials like koalas even evolved to eat nothing but eucalyptus, making them, in my opinion, the most Australian animal possible. Each time the lands of New Guinea and the rest of the shelf re-emerged, it would have been Australia supplying colonists to repopulate, serving as the functional mainland to what would become the rest of the Australasian islands. Well, except that is until recently. If you hadn't noticed, Australia is not as green as she once was. The land's movement northward coincided with ice sheets forming over Antarctica, signifying the beginning of the Quaternary Ice Age, and the worldwide tropical climate broke into an arid subtropics, a temperate, and a polar zone. Australia's movement brought it into the subtropics, or basically the wrong place at the wrong time, and what was once a densely forested land quickly desertified. To this day, Australia remains the driest of the major landmasses, besides maybe Antarctica, I guess, with scalding hot deserts covering a higher percentage of its land area than anywhere else on Earth. In ecological terms, Australia's carrying capacity had collapsed, and as a result, plant and animal populations collapsed too, causing the realm to lose much of its biological richness. Fortunately, however, at least one corner of the Australasian realm was spared, the northernmost portion of it. Also thanks to the Ice Age, sea levels dropped drastically by this time, exposing nearly the entire shelf as recently as 8,000 years ago, forming a continent called Sahul. These newly dried lands just so happen to reach into the equatorial tropics, supporting tremendous rainforests on just this edge of the landmass that best embody the realm's historic richness. 
Because these lands were all still attached, it could be said that this natural wealth still very much resided within the Australasian arena. But then the planet entered the warmer interglacial period we're in now, causing sea levels to rise again, flooding enough of the shelf to cut Sahul into Australia and New Guinea. Despite representing only about 10% of the continent's land area, New Guinea ended up containing nearly all of its tropical rainforest, leaving the land down under with nothing but the lower productivity deciduous forest, all the arid grasslands, and certainly all of the desert. This funny geographical quirk of the Australian, or I guess Sahulian continent has resulted in the isolation of its most productive and diverse region from a much wider arena spanning multiple different environments. As such, this has caused a much more recent shift in the balance of power, or I guess in ecological terms, a shift in their share of the gene pool, where now it's New Guinea that hosts the best representation of Australasia's former glory, altogether making a good argument for it to be considered the modern day mainland of the realm. If so, that would qualify Australia, at least biogeographically, as an island. But before we get carried away, if you've watched my other biogeography videos, you'll know that island environments all have pretty observable evolutionary impacts on their animals. And so if Australia really is an island, then we should be able to find at least a few cases of island syndrome like insular dwarfism or gigantism among its inhabitants. Of course, a look at the marsupials of modern day Australia compared to their mainland Gondwanan ancestors shows they've all grown drastically in this time, serving as tempting evidence to support this case. The only problem is there's another, even better explanation. What we're forgetting is that 66 million years ago, right before marsupials arrived in Australia, an asteroid struck the Earth, wiping out all but a handful of the dinosaurs, effectively freeing up nearly every niche for any survivors to claim. As marsupials evolved to fill these roles previously played by dinosaurs, they grew to match their size, explaining why we see such a big difference between modern marsupials and their ancestors. The way we know this is the cause behind their growth is because placental mammals experienced the very same evolution into larger and larger forms all across the rest of the world at the same exact time. And the fact that the animals of the Australian environment, even when isolated on a desert land, still mirrored the evolutionary trends of the rest of the world's continental arenas works against the case of it being an island. But okay, I know what you're saying. Australia is home to more than just marsupials, and there's no way I'd consider this a thorough biogeographic evaluation without looking at some birds. Of course, everyone should know by now, emus rule supreme as the undefeated military power on the continent, in no small part thanks to their height, standing nearly two meters tall. But when compared to the rest of the rat-type family, we'll see emus are rather average, standing just shorter than ostriches but taller than rheas, both of which also come from continental arenas. However, before humans arrived, even larger birds like Dromornis stertoni, or perhaps more fittingly called the Thunderbird, as well as Bumblecornis, nicknamed the Demon Duck, lived here, standing even taller than island giants like elephant birds from Madagascar or the Moa of New Zealand. In fact, the Thunderbird is considered to be the largest avian species ever discovered. At the other end of the scale, New Guinea's biggest birds, the cassowaries, are some of the shortest in the ratite family, especially the dwarf cassowary, which only weakens New Guinea's case for being a mainland, considering this looks like a textbook example of island dwarfism. Of course, if I'm going to start bringing up extinct animals like the Thunderbird, I might as well remind you that until very recently, Australia was home to a much larger community of megafauna. The now extinct thylacine represented the largest carnivorous animal here, roughly equaling the size of other continental predators like wolves or big cats. 
Bigger predators hunted bigger prey, such as Procopterdon goliath, also known as the short-faced kangaroo, the largest kangaroo, standing about as tall as other bipedal mammals. Then there was Diprotodon, which was the largest overall marsupial, basically a bison-sized koala, alongside the largest known monotremes, or egg-laying mammals, Murray glossus, and Abdurodon, the largest known platypus. Though even when all lined up together, the Australasian megafauna measure rather consistently against those found across the rest of the continents. If anything, the realm's biggest animals appear on average a little smaller than everywhere else, which again makes sense considering Australia is the smallest of the major landmasses. Because of this, it appears to me that Australia's size and its varied environments have allowed it to continue acting as a continental arena. Maybe a small continental arena, but a continental arena nonetheless. So where does this leave us? Well, clearly the Australian landmass has played the defining role in the development of the realm's many unique flora and fauna, to the point where I feel confident calling it the mainland of Australasia, even if the burden of preserving much of the realm's remaining biodiversity has more recently shifted to New Guinea. While this doesn't necessarily equate to being a continent, this does mean, at least in a biogeographic sense, that Australia is not an island. And I think that's as close to an answer to this silly question as we're gonna get. Like I said at the very beginning of this video, what we call places doesn't really matter. Continent, island, mainland, realm, none of these actually exist. They're all just ideas. What is real are the plants and animals that live here, and what they tell us is that this is certainly a remarkable part of not only its regions, but the world's wealth of life. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. So what do you all think? Did I answer this question once and for all? I sure think I did. Of course, let me know what you think in the comments. Depending on when I am recording this, I might have just bought my first house. So I really need to thank my patrons for their continued support of this channel and me. Hopefully this means there are some more exciting developments for the channel coming soon. So subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thanks.